In the course of a Batson challenge in a criminal case, how specific does the prosecutor's non-discriminatory reason have to be on the record? To find out, you have to read People versus Right, but it's 45 pages. Don't have time for that? I've got you covered. This is TLDR, Too Long Didn't Read, where I cover New York Court of Appeals cases, and I try to do it in five minutes or less. This is the episode on the case of People versus Right. The citation for this case is 2024, New York Slip Opinion 03320, published by the New York Court of Appeals on June 18th of 2024. The issue in this case, there's a couple of issues, but the primary issue addressed is whether the prosecutor actually provided a a uh, a pretextual reason for a peremptory challenge used in a criminal case. To understand and appreciate the context of the case, the background that's helpful to know is that there's two kinds of challenges in a criminal case. There's a for cause challenge, meaning that the juror that's being challenged can't be fair and impartial. You have an unlimited number of those. But there's also something called a peremptory challenge. A peremptory challenge is under CPL, Criminal Procedure Law 270.25. It's a challenge. It's an objection to seating a juror for which reasons need not be given. It's a challenge for no reason in particular. You can you can challenge a juror peremptorily. Uh, a certain number of challenges. Uh, each side is given a certain number of peremptory challenges, depending on the level of crime the defendant is facing, if it's an A felony, B felony, C felony, D felony, misdemeanor. And you can use it for any reason in the world, except it can't be used for a discriminatory reason. You're not allowed to use a peremptory challenge to exclude a person, a juror, a prospective juror for their, re- for their race or for their gender or for their sexual orientation. You can't use a peremptory challenge in a discriminatory way. And the way that they the way that the case law has developed a test to try to prevent discriminatory uses of peremptory challenges, it's called the Batson test. There's three parts to it. Part one is the moving party must show, must make a prima facie showing that the opposing party is trying to use a peremptory challenge to remove a potential juror on the forbidden ground because of discrimination on the basis of race or gender, sexual orientation, one of those bases. Step two, if step one is met, then the judge will say, okay, step two, the burden shifts to the non-moving party to come forward with the non-discriminatory reasons for each of this challenge strikes. That's step two. If they, if the step two is met, the judge then shifts it back to the moving party to persuade the court that the reasons are merely a pretext for intentional discrimination. At that point, the judge has to decide whether it was pretext or not. And the general rule is that the judge's decision on step three is given great deference, great deference. Only where the trial court's decisions as to pretext has no record support should it be overturned on appeal. That's the basic grounds. That's the basic understanding uh, and background for this case. The facts are that in March of 2017, two men are alleged to have robbed a Taco Bell restaurant. There's a lot of facts about the robbery, but that doesn't really matter for the primary part of the appeal. When it comes to trial, uh, the people, the prosecution tries to use peremptory challenges as to two particular jurors that are challenged, Cece and Casey. Cece is an unmarried black man with no children, rents his home. Importantly, Cece talks about that uh, 15 years earlier, his cousin was arrested for having marijuana at a family gathering. Multiple cousins were arrested, including an aunt. And the Cece, when asked, uh, when asked further, Cece said, with respective negative feelings about the police, yeah, the way that the way, the way they took everybody, I didn't know they had to take everybody, but that was it. The people then tried to use a peremptory challenge as to Cece, and they received a Batson challenge saying that it was alleged that they were using it uh, in a discriminatory way. The court, in that, Batson, in, that Batson, in the Batson inquiry, the court found a prima facie showing and asked for the people to give non-discriminatory reasons. They basically gave the reason that Cece had cousins who had been arrested, friends of multiple arrests, re- rents, has no children, and is not married. The defense countered that there were other jurors similarly situated in the same position that were not challenged. The court found the reasons for the strike were not discriminatory. They were not pretextual, accepted the reasons and dismissed the jury, dismissed that juror. As to Casey, Casey is a black woman. She works in law enforcement in the Department of Probation. She does juvenile diversion uh, programs. She interviews juveniles to see if they, uh, to determine if they should receive intake diversion, like short-term probation. Um, people tried to use a peremptory challenge as to her, KC, and the defense made a Batson challenge. The court found prima facie showing had been made. The people said the department works for the Department of Probation, that KC works for the Department of Probation in family court and works with juveniles. So sympathy could be an issue. 
The defense countered and said sympathy would not interfere with deliberations, and similar people in her situation were not challenged. The court found, once again, that this was not pretextual. This was a proper use of a peremptory challenge. The defendant was ultimately convicted of Rob II and crim trespass. Appeals. Uh, the appellate division affirms, the procedural history is the appellate division affirmed the conviction and said the defendant failed to satisfy the burden under step three, that the race neutral reasons were pretextual. The big, it goes to the court of appeals here and the big fight here between the majority and the dissent, this goes to a four, four to three majority and dissent. The majority says, the only thing we have to look at here is whether there's record support for what the judge decided. Here, the judge cited to, there is record support. They go through the record. There's re- there, there's things backing up what the judge said. That's all we have to look at. So they say uh, it's sufficient. The judge had a reason to find the way the judge found. And as to identification procedures, it was fair, not unduly suggestive. But the dissent here makes a big deal about saying it's not just about whether there's record support. It's did the people properly and sufficiently allege, they articulate. You can't, people can't just say CC had reasons. And if there's record support, that's sufficient. The dissent says the people have to rely, have to, have to make a record specifically of what those reasons are. They have to make a specific factual showing in their step two uh, to articulate what the reasons are that are non-dis- non-discriminatory reasons. And if there's record support for that, then it's sufficient. To simply say, well, works for the Department of Probation and not specifically cite to them, uh, dissent says it's bad, the majority says it's good. So once again, the overall ruling here for the majority is they are according the the judges in Batson decisions, great deference. And the only role of an appellate court here should be to see if there's record support for that decision. And there was here. That's the case of people versus right. Have a good day. If you like what you just saw and want to see more just like it, please hit like or subscribe to let me know.